Hey, Don's fans, we're here with Leonard Griffin, head men's soccer coach at USF. And, you know, Leonard, thanks for being here. I mean, right off the bat, Joan hires you last year, and it's pretty historic. Um, I, I looked at some data from 2018 with a total of 528 division soccer programs. At that point, there was only 16 black head coaches. Ten of them held positions on the women's side. And at that point, there were no female black coaches. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on the advancement of black coaches in the NCAA. For me, it's always been very apparent, uh, the lack of black coaches or black players in our country. Um, and for me, it's just truly an honor and a privilege to be considered and to be hired. Um, and I'm very humbled and thankful for Joan uh, McDermott and Frank Alaco, Mark Papadopoulos for um, looking past all racial um, uh, barriers and, and essentially just hiring the, the best man that they felt uh, fit for the position. You know, so for me to come to a university like the University of San Francisco, which has a, a rich history of having the firsts and now to be the first African-American head coach in, these, in a storied program like our men's soccer uh, program is truly an honor and a privilege. So because soccer is very much a pay to play model, it eliminates a lot of underprivileged communities to be able to participate. And so um, a lot of players then don't become educated on soccer, that soccer even exists. And, you know, I've been out to the Bayview and they're doing some, um, some fantastic, fantastic things with um, the Bayview um, soccer team and Phil Ginsburg and, and Park and Recreations of just um, um, bringing soccer to those communities so that they're aware it's even out there as a, as a sport. And so that's been fantastic to see that, those little steps being taken. Um, and then on uh, the coaching side of things, I think it takes um, people in positions of power to um, make the choice and make a conscious choice to uh, be culturally uh, diverse and inclusive of all races, um, but especially black people that you'd, they're, they're not visible in those positions um, at a higher level. So um, I think those are the two folds that I would say to that. Yeah, and with the death of George Floyd and the movement of social injustice, you know, what steps have you taken to reach out to your players? Yeah, I think that's uh, kind of a long-winded answer. I think for me, it's uh, something that we've looked to be prepared for from day one when I got the position. Um, I think our staff, myself and my staff, have wanted to create a culture where players feel comfortable um, uh, communicating and talking with each other as teammates, with us as a staff, and that's all rooted in relationships built on trust. And so we spent a lot of time um, building individual relationships with our players, um, building a relationship with our team as a collective unit with, through meetings and talks and presentations where our locker room and our team um, has created this safe space where they feel comfortable. And I think uh, throughout the season, um, we've been able to have difficult conversations both in and outside of soccer. And so when these horrific events happened um, to George Floyd, um, it allowed us to feel comfortable in that space, even as challenging and difficult as it was for many of our student athletes. Um, for us, because of COVID-19, we've been having these Zoom calls uh, we do a, a team culture one at the beginning of the week and then a, t a tactical soccer session at the end of the week. I loosely touched on what was going on in society and then kind of jumped right into talking about soccer and team tactics. When I got off the call, it didn't sit right with me that I didn't open up the platform and allow our student athletes to talk about their feelings, how they feel, or even let them know that um, I was there for them as, as their head coach, especially as a black man. And had multiple conversations with my wife and um, many other people, but uh, felt it was a missed opportunity. So I immediately called an impromptu meeting for the next morning. I had to let them know that I was here for them. I see them um, and I'm there for them and uh, wanted to make sure that 
we continue to uphold um, the safe space that we've been working so hard to build. Interestingly enough, later that evening at 12 midnight, I get a, a text message from one of my black players who comes to me and asks, coach, have you, have you talked to our team about what's going on? And um, I said, not in the way I wanted to, but we're having a call tomorrow. Um, it was a graduating senior. Would you, can you please jump on the call? It, w- it would mean a lot. And he then shared to me uh, a conversation he had just 30 minutes prior of one of our white freshman players or student athletes reach out to him just to check in to see if he's okay, to see how he's doing, to get his perspective on what's going on. Now, mind you, this player that reached out to him lives in Minnesota. George Floyd was killed basically right in his backyard. This is the first time he's seeing this sort of blatant racism up close and personal. So um, as a head coach, for me, I was so proud that that white player felt comfortable enough to reach out to his black teammate who's three or four years older and ask some very difficult questions. And the fact that that black player felt comfortable enough to come and reach out to me as his head coach um, means a lot as well. And I think that whole kind of situation lends to what we've been trying to accomplish in terms of building that culture built on trust, built on communication, creating that safe space so that we can come together as a unit because I firmly believe that the relationships that they build as a team outside of soccer will allow them to fight that much harder for each other on the field. And I think that can be a mirror of what happens in society. Can we get to know each other on a deeper, more human level so that when things like this happen or that we can continue to fight and push for true um, equality for all? You've been having many productive conversations with colleagues about how to create change, and you brought up four really great points, and I'm wondering if you can share those with us. Those four points come from our leader at the university, our president, Father Paul, which I thought hit it spot on when he addressed um, the George Floyd situation with our entire uh, community at the university, and I think his four points were spot on, and I kind of... um, just expanded on those a little bit in terms of how to really take action. Reach out to your black student athletes individually. Um, I think that means a lot to just to see how they're doing, to check in um, and let them know that you're there for them. To communicate with your team collectively um, about the recent events in our society. There's no such thing as a bad question. So talk to your black family, your black friends, colleagues, Um, and continue to watch, listen, learn, read, so that you can help take action in the fight. Keep diversity, equity, and inclusion at the top of your agenda. And uh, for me, that's something that has to happen. We are still dealing with racism in 2020. George Floyd and the circumstances that happened is not a one-off. This has happened multiple times and Again, it, it brings to light so many emotions of disappointment, of anger, of sadness, but we have to know that this happens every day and will continue to happen if the words that people are so powerfully standing up and voicing now aren't put to action. So we had um, a great diversity and inclusion discussion for USF staff members that spoke out against um, or talked about racial inequality, um, talked about microaggressions um, and made a great analogy comparing it to mosquito bites um, where um, these microaggressions, once you get them one time, it's kind of just like one mosquito bite you can deal with. But as black people, we have these microaggressions every single day and it becomes uh, where it's like mosquito bites all over your body and trying to imagine how annoying and Um, frustrating that would be to deal with on a daily basis. And so I thought the message and the way it was presented was very impactful. And as a department, you know, we could continue to have these types of meetings 
um, and intentionally schedule them so that we can continue to keep this on the forefront um, and not just let it, you know, these things slip through the cracks. Yeah, and you know, you have two beautiful young children. Uh, just talk about raising your children in today's society, your fears and your hopes. Yeah, I think that's, um, gosh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a large spectrum um, when you think of it, raising black kids in this country. Um, I think on the short side of the spectrum, it's um, creating that environment a little bit like we are with our team where we're preparing them for situations that they're gonna face every single day. I have a four and a six year old, a four year old girl and a six year old boy. And we very openly have conversations about the color of their skin, about some of the microaggressions that they may face, um, about how all people should be created equal, but unfortunately they're, they aren't always. And so um, being able to have these conversations and for them to understand that um, they can come to us and ask questions, I think is extremely important so that we can continue to educate them. Um, and then obviously on the far end of the spectrum is um, the fear of what happened to George Floyd and that can be your son or daughter that um, ends up uh, under under a knee so that's the the spectrum that we have to deal with with um as black parents um it's something that i vividly remember as um a kid growing up and how my parents dealt with it with us and it was just an everyday preparation um of what it is to be black in america uh, at any given time and one i'm going to share one story that sticks out vividly is i remember i think i had to be five maybe six years old and i'm driving in the back of my mom's station wagon and my parents didn't allow us to have toy guns as a kid and i remember i built a toy gun out of legos and uh, we're driving in the back seat i stuck the my lego toy gun out the window and pretended like i was shooting someone and my mom literally swerved to the side of the road and could have gotten in an accident herself um pulled the car over and completely um, ripped me apart of why that was completely unacceptable, why I could never do that, um, and scared, scared me to death, really, of what I had just done. And as a young kid, may not have fully understand why she was doing that, but obviously now um, fully comprehend that and realize um, you know, what she was doing in terms of raising a black um, boy in America. You talk about having these hard conversations with your players. You know, we are in the middle of a pandemic, but sports will be starting soon. And I'm wondering when your team does get back and um, you, you're all facing each other, what are some things that we're doing to keep the dialogue going? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think we've tried our best as a staff to continue it, uh, these hard conversations through COVID-19. Obviously we're limited based on distance now, but um, I think it's very much um, setting up these intentional uh, meetings and conversations. It's intentionally taking the time to build these relationships with um, your players and getting to know them, having them get to know each other more um, so that you all feel comfortable going out and being um, influencers of change. And, it's amazing to look at what USF, the USF community has been doing recently when you look at, uh, and this is just in recent conversations, but um, you look at men's basketball putting together a coalition to help underprivileged communities, um, both in sport and in education. Um, you look at what our black student athletes have been posting and voicing their, their um, thoughts, feelings, and opinions and making a stand. Um, so it, it's just making sure you take the time to um, create these intentional action steps. You know, I think another great one to see is um, I see I've seen some football coaches now that have uh, voice that they won't practice on election day and they will march their teams down um, so that they can exercise their right to vote. Um, again, an action step. You know, action steps can be subtle. They can be um, on the other end and and far more. Um, impactful however you you might take that but 
Um, I think it, the important thing is just to make sure that and to know that it's not enough just to post and do nothing. It's, you know, it will take a whole lot of steps um, to figure out how you can actually take action um, against the fight um, against racism in our country.